thank you all for coming out. Many of you after a long day in studio, it's great to have some alumni back in the room. Um, I'm Keith Crumwitty, Dean of the Architecture Division, which I believe everyone in the room knows. The maybe people who the are alums. watching, maybe not some of the alums. Um, thanks for joining us tonight for tonight's lecture, Constructing Architectural Ecologies by Margaret Ikeda, Evan Jones, and Adam Marcus. This is the sixth and final event of our fall 2022 lecture series, Climate Justice, through which we're exploring and reflecting upon the entangled relationships between the climate crisis and racial and social justice. At CCA, we believe it's important to acknowledge the history of the land upon which we're working and honor those who came before us. We understand land acknowledgement as a transformative act meant to confront our place on native lands and build mindfulness of our present participation in colonial legacy. This campus is located in Yalamu, also known as San Francisco, on the unceded territory of the Ramatu Shaloni people, who have continuously lived upon this land on the memorial. We honor indigenous peoples past, present, and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders. Before we begin tonight's event, I'd like to thank the organizers of this series, Irene Chang, Adam Marcus, Adam Marcus, and Niraj Bhatia. <clears throat> I couldn't think of a better way to conclude our fall series than with the lecture by Margaret, Evan, and Adam, CCA faculty members and co-directors of the Architectural Ecologies Lab, a research and teaching lab here in the Architecture Division at CCA. So there are those who still choose to ignore the evidence of climate change and its unequal impacts as it literally piles up around them. It's clear that we can no longer deny the fact that we face a future of rising sea levels, stronger and more frequent storms, prolonged droughts, increased fire risk, that will be increasingly inhospitable to human and non-human life. The point at which we might have halted progress, the progress in climate change may be behind us, but an action is not an option. We need to adapt. An adaptation in how we think, how we design, how we build, and who we build for lies at the core of the teaching and research of the Architectural Ecologies Lab. The lab, founded in 2018, serves as a platform for collaborative research between designers, artists, scientists, and manufacturers. Operating at the intersection of architecture, fabrication, and ecology, the lab, which was born out of a series of studios that some of you took, that explored architecture's response to the impending impacts of climate change, merges spatial practice with innovative techniques of material production, rigorous ecological research, and public engagement. The lab's work leverages interdisciplinary expertise and meaningful collaborations with science and industry to develop compelling architectural strategies to address ecological challenges like sea level rise, habitat restoration, and climate adaptation. Central to the lab's work is a commitment to engage in diverse publics and developing design processes that extend ideas beyond the academic studio and into the real world. The Architectural Ecologies Lab offers many lessons, not least of which are the value of studio-based research with bright, inquisitive, uh, and innovative students. An interdisciplinary collaboration with scientists, artists, and manufacturers in pursuit of new ways of working for all involved that allow for the imagining of new habitats for a variety of life forms, including humans. And now, Margaret Ikeda, Evan Jones, and Adam Marcus. Up here so we can be recorded too. Um, thanks so much, Keith, for the generous introduction. Um, and thanks um, to the committee that included us, which is Naraj or Irene and Adam, that included us in the climate justice lecture series, uh, where uh, I want to call out Adam because you, Adam, Bill Chrysler's here. He just walked in and I'm super. So Bill, I have to have you, even though we'll reference you, Bill is, um, you know, Probably one of the reasons we got, we have been doing what we're doing because he challenged us in 2014, not to just build on water with a barge. He said if, uh, that the sphere is the most buoyant form and why are we not building something more innovative? So we often credit and blame Bill <laughs> for the direction we, we have been going. And he has been super instrumental as you will see. But thanks, Bill, for making your way because he's my pleasure. Yeah, thank really you. It. So uh, we're I'm so happy that all of you are here. There's alumni and uh, current 
to the faculty and I know it's just a busy time of year to stay for these lectures so it's such a pleasure to see you. For those of you that are current CCA students it's we're really happy to be able to share this work with you because I think sometimes it's not clear what the labs do so hopefully you'll have a chance to see what the architecture ecologies lab is and uh, what we're deeply passionate about and feel strongly about. Uh, and if the work resonates with you, um, please reach out to us because there's ways to be involved. Uh, we also want to give a shout out to Elisa Finley that in 2018, she was the interim chair here. And we were doing some kind of ad hoc things that were coming out of the studios, things that naturally wanted to a research that naturally wanted to find its place in um, the world, thanks to Bill really building some of these prototypes. And uh, she convinced Adam, Evan and I to, she thought there was a value in formulating a lab, the architecture ecology lab. So we wanna really credit her for giving the, us the nudge to move this work into a new level that allows us to have a lot more impact. So, um, so I want to acknowledge all our students. There's a slide coming up that's pretty kind of amazing. It's a slide of all the students that have been part of um, studios, either former or even currently um, studios that we have run out of the architect that is how is association with the architecture ecologies lab, including um, our studio right now that I'm teaching with Mark. Donahue, we've kind of moved, we've been focused on the coast, but we've moved into the forest. And the students whose names are in blue are students that over during our time have helped us as research assistants or research fellows in the work that you'll see. So we find we um, all this work we're showing tonight is deeply collaborative and shared in its authorship and execution by these people. We want to especially acknowledge the many research assistants that I mentioned and our current research assistants are Jared, which you can maybe raise your hand and Conrad and Claire. So I think if you're interested in what we do, it, they are great people to reach out to. Next, um, while well, all three of us are educators at CCA and directors of the Architecture Ecologies Lab, we also, we're also each practitioners working on real world projects outside the academic context. Although our individual practices are very diverse from housing to planning to public art installations, we think this shared grounding in practice brings a sense of pragmatism um, to the work we do at Architecture Ecologies Lab. Tonight, we're going to show four projects, uh, a sample of four projects that we have developed in the lab. And for each project, we'll try to highlight how the work interfaces with each of these three strands of our practice, architecture, ecological research, and public engagement. So with architecture, our approach to architecture emphasizes prototypes and interventions that are actionable and activist. We are fundamentally interested in things that can be realized. We consider our physical lab to be less a space housed within CCA, but rather sites throughout the Bay. Our work is also stubbornly extra disciplinary. We insist that architects must reach outside the discipline of architecture to collaborate with other experts in order to reinforce our own disciplinary capacities. This is most evident in our approach to multi-species design, a common theme in the work which often demands expertise outside architecture. Our approach to ecological research emphasizes what we call pedagogy of informed <laughs> And that's what, this is what all our students, the names that you saw before uh, were uh, part of that process. We're not scientists or experts in ecology, but we can speculate in an informed way through design. Through a collaboration, we learn how and when to ask questions that open up opportunities for linking design and ecology. And we try to impart this methodology to our students, just as ecological expertise inspires us to think about design in a different way, we found that design speculation can inspire scientists to think about their own disciplines, discipline in new ways. Public engagement is a critical part of the lab's research. Fundamentally, we believe that our work needs to be out and tested in the world. 
and in dialogue with communities and stakeholders. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I can't be there in person tonight. Um, we're going to start with the Buoyant Ecologies Float Lab, um, which is a project that grew out of our first collaboration when I came to CCA in 2013, 2014, started co-teaching with Margaret and Evan. Our work typically begins, um, you can go to the next slide, um, with the premise of material performance at an ecosystemic scale. With each project, we ask, how might material strategies at the micro scale have broader and transformative impact at the scale of an entire ecosystem? In many cases, this involves using computational and digital fabrication capabilities to develop innovative material substrates that can catalyze beneficial effects at a larger scale. You can go to the next slide. Oh, I think we missed, I think you, you skipped ahead too far. Yeah, one more. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so three important partners have been critical to the development of the Buoyant Ecologies Project in particular. These include the Benthic Lab at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, Composites Manufacturer of Chrysler and Associates, and Bill, sorry to miss you tonight, but so glad you're here. Um, and the Port of Oakland, who has provided the site for the project's deployment. Throughout the design process, we've also worked closely um, with two of our amazing research assistants, MARC alumni, Taylor Metcalf and Jereen Pierre. The ecological premise of the project challenges conventional notions of fouling which if you're a boat owner, you're familiar with um, the unwanted accumulation of marine life on the underside of anything that floats in salt water. Traditionally, species that attach themselves to the hulls of floating structures are called fouling communities because they create resistance in the water when the structure moves. And this is often seen as a nuisance. This project, however, seeks to turn biofouling into an asset. Instead, proposing that controlled upside down communities of invertebrates can become an ecological resource both by creating biodiversity and by accumulating into large masses that can attenuate waves. So it's in this regard that the project aligns the interests of marine life with human life. The primary vehicle for catalyzing this research was a series of integrated studios that Margaret, Evan, and I co-taught at CCA from 2014 to 2016. These studios explored a range of speculative architectural projects that focus on multi-species design and incorporated the idea of the optimized ecological substrate, always thinking about the underside of floating structures as a kind of upside down scaffold for life. One important thing to note here um, is that while this work was entirely speculative, the remarkable ability of our students to visualize their ideas in compelling ways was absolutely crucial in building excitement and momentum and support as we moved into prototyping these ideas. With the support of Chrysler and Associates, we began to prototype sections of these speculative geometries at full scale. Um, the work uh, primarily focuses on FRP, fiber reinforced polymer composites, um, commonly known, referred to as fiberglass. This material, which is often used in sailboats and other watercraft, is lightweight, strong in curvature, corrosion resistant, and ideal for marine applications. The workflow integrates both analog and digital processes. This will be very familiar to our students, starting with a digital model, which is used to relay instructions to a robotic router. The robot cuts positive molds from expanded polystyrene foam, and then glass fibers and resin are hand packed in layers to build up the composite thickness, which is finished with a coat that provides a rough finished texture. Working with our collaborators at Benthic Lab, who are a, gr a group of amazing marine ecologists, we began to develop more rigorous and quantitative models for designing these substrates. The hypothesis was that the geometry of underwater surfaces could be designed to produce hillocks and valleys of variable sizes, optimized to produce habitats of different scales and for different species. The idea is that the customized topography would protect smaller organisms from larger predators and therefore maintain biodiversity in the food web. The design of these topographies makes use of statistical models that relate rugosity or the magnitude of a surface's bumpiness, slope, and geometric spacing to anticipate ecological growth over time. Since 2015, nearly two dozen 60 centimeter by 60 centimeter FRP plate prototypes have been fabricated to test the ecological performance 
of different surface geometries at full scale. At first glance, these appear to be a collection of arbitrary forms, but they're actually each the result of very specific and quantitative geometric parameters established by the ecologists. These plates have been installed underwater for monitoring and documentation to evaluate the performance as ecological habitats, and they were almost immediately settled by many types of diverse invertebrates. Each round of prototypes has informed the next, and all, all of these were done in collaboration with our students in the Boyne Ecology Studios um, in the early studios. And um, specific criteria regarding surface geometry, rugosity, and slope integrated into the digital models used to quantify these parameters, test iterations, and output instructions for the robotic fabrication of the molds. So after several rounds, we got to a point where a, a before and after comparison of one of the prototypes demonstrates um, proof of concept for the, the hypothesis for the ecological substrate. The invertebrates attached to the surface after about 12 weeks underwater, which you see on the right, include bryozoans, tube worms, sponges, crabs, nudibranchs, crustaceans, mollusks, and sea urchins, among others. But the important conclusion here is that these species appear to cluster together in different topographical zones, evident in the gradients of color. Some species gravitate towards the peaks, others towards the valleys, and others to the sides. This correlation between geometry and settlement patterns confirmed for us that gradated topography could produce gradated habitats, thereby suggesting that surface optimization could support broader ecological diversity. And so with, with the proof of concept success of these experiments, we began to speculate about how to test these ideas at a larger scale. And here you can see one of Margaret's early concept sketches of what became the Boyan Ecology's float lab. Our intent in scaling up was to test gradients of surface geometry across broader extents, distances, and also create a kind of floating research platform from which additional material experiments could be suspended. So as, as we worked on the design for the float lab, um, and this is around 2016, 2017, um, the, uh, it developed its, its kind of bean shape and plan and consisted of two identical parts that form the top and the bottom like a clamshell. So they come together in the middle. This diagram describes the project's multiple types of ecological performance. On the bottom side, the surface, the surface topography gradates from smooth to rough to test how these geometries relate to the underwater flow. On the top side, the topography forms ridges and valleys that simulate a tidal watershed habitat for plants and terrestrial species. On the right, you see some speculative drawings that imagine how clusters and networks of these modules might start to perform as floating breakwaters with dense upside down habitats that have the capacity to help attenuate wave action and limit shoreline erosion. Here you can see how this modular logic is embedded within the float labs design and fabrication process, anticipating future deployment at a greater scale. Instead of using disposable single use EPS foam molds, we convinced Bill and his team <laughs> to fabricate uh, the project using a reusable FRP mold, which can be used to produce both the identical top and bottom parts, as well as maybe hopefully additional future prototypes. Um, the fabrication workflow is similar to what we showed earlier. Um, we milled a single EPS foam positive using um, Chrysler's gigantic robotic router. This positive plug was used to produce a single multi-use FRP negative mold, which was then used to fabricate the two parts to constitute the float lab. The cross section through the float lab shows how the two identical hulls adhere together to form a buoyant structure. The interior contains ballast uh, to optimize its buoyancy and bilge pumps to prevent water from collecting in the interior. Here you can see a photo of the completed float lab on CCA's back lot. Um, with Clark Tanhouse's amazing confetti urbanism graphics in the background. Um, it took uh, just over a year to secure the necessary permits for the deployment of the float lab. And in many ways, um, when we present this project, we, we often say that we think this slide represents the most significant accomplishment so far. Um, how as a pilot project, it has contributed to shifting regulatory attitudes towards climate mitigation and climate adaptation in the Bay Area. 
To our knowledge, this project is the first of its kind to secure permits from both the State Bay Conservation and Development Commission and the Federal US Army Corps of Engineers. The deployment site is at Oakland's Middle Harbor, which is in the middle of the Port of Oakland across the Bay from San Francisco. And uh, the port is the fifth largest container port in the US. Um, we worked closely with the port over several years to identify the ideal site for the float lab and its ongoing maintenance. The project was launched in the Bay in September 2019 by the port, um, who has amazing expertise to do this kind of thing, which we don't have. Um, it was craned into the water gently, towed to its mooring location, uh, where it still floats today with a great view of San Francisco and the Bay. And here are some views from above. Um, here are some recent video footage from one of our visits to the float labs. You get a sense of kind of its scale relative to the context. And over time, you can start to see how both the top and the bottom are totally covered with life. The top side is now covered with a kind of disgusting patina of bird guano, salt, and algae. And this recent video of the underside shows how the substrate is completely covered with marine invertebrates, all sorts of species, which we were very happy about. Um, since, it's, since it was launched, we've been using the float lab to suspend additional prototypes to continue the material research. And this has really become the kind of main um, focus of our work out there. We call these ecological habitat columns, and we're particularly interested in experimenting with natural materials that are not petroleum-based, biomaterials, etc. cetera. Um, here you see on the right some of 3D printed calcium carbonate modules uh, that was designed and fabricated by our colleague, Alex Schofield. Um, these were installed underwater a couple years ago, and just four weeks later, were completely settled with invertebrates, including even some small oysters, which we were excited to see and did not totally expect in this site. We've also been testing a series of 3D printed ceramic modules developed in ecological tectonic seminar that I've co-taught with Alex Schofield. I'm really excited about this particular material. Um, the robotic 3D printing process allows us to have precise control over variation, but more importantly, clay is totally natural, renewable and durable when fired. And it seems like a really promising material for these kinds of substrates. Margaret has also worked with students in the Constructed Ecologies elective to prototype fish habitats from biodegradable materials like local creek dogwood and royal willow branches. Can go back one. There you go. Um, in addition to the material research, we've set up time lapse cameras to document life on the float lab when we're not there. We're thrilled to see it's become an active feeding perch for all sorts of marine birds who frequently leave us fish skeletons on the top side when they're done. And just to conclude this project, and maybe to come back to the notion of thinking at the ecosystemic scale, um, we always continue to speculate at larger scales. Um, and returning in many ways to some of the themes explored in the initial studios, this drawing here imagines an enlarged flow lab, floating architecture that can engage productively with the surrounding ecosystem, an architecture that leverages technology for things like water recycling and aquaculture, but also an architecture that relies on an idea of cohabitation, humans living in concert with non-humans, contingent upon one another for ecological resilience. Hi, uh, I'm Evan Jones, and I'll be presenting a, a single project that uh, built upon the ecological substrate research uh, for a commission permanent installation at uh, San Francisco's Presidio. Uh, in 2018, we were approached by the Presidio Trust, uh, a unique federal organization uh, set up when the Presidio was decommissioned as an army base in the early 90s and tasked with uh, independently managing uh, the Presidio. Uh, they heard about our work with uh, ecological, ecological substrates, and they were interested in collaborating with us uh, on a new uh, covert project in Chrissy Marsh, you can see in the red dot. Uh, 
The culvert links uh, the recently David Tennessee Hollow Creek, which is upland, uh, with Chrissy Marsh. And it was constructed as part of a comprehensive infrastructural project to underground the new 101 freeway, uh, allowing for the new Tunnel Tops Park, you can see in the upper right, which just opened uh, in June. You should all go see it. Oh, yeah, uh, the construction of the culvert was really the last phase before the upper creek could be connected to the new marsh. And you can see here the 101 freeway on the left is uh, splayed out to allow for more daylight to enter the new marsh. And the culvert is really a link between the creek coming in from the left and the marsh to the right. Uh, and we did an initial phase of work at the marsh before the culvert was built, uh, before proceeding. Uh, here you can see a site plan and section done by uh, former AEL lab assistant Nicole Quo uh, that shows how the Daylit Creek connects to uh, Chrissy Marsh. Uh, and it really, the culvert exists kind of directly at the interface between the freshwater and it was identified as an opportunity for creating uh, textured panels designed to recruit the Olympia oyster, which is both a native species but also endangered within the bay. So part of the research involved understanding the inter interaction between the heavier salt water with the lighter fresh water, which forms a lens at the top of the surface before it mixes together and moves out into the bay. So we began with uh, a few initial experiments to determine the viability of recruiting oysters in the marsh. It wasn't even clear even to our biologists how many oyster larvae were even present there. Uh, and we were able to actually reuse some of the panels from the Boeing Ecology Studio, uh, which you can see on the left. And we fabricated a series of smaller panels of various textures as well. And these were suspended under a floating clear glass buoy uh, that was inspired by uh, Japanese fishermen who would use these leaves to float their nets uh, in the ocean. Uh, so we wanted to avoid the, the bright styrofoam floats, which uh, which are kind of typical and, uh, and call attention to themselves. And uh, so the clear glass was like a good natural kind of stealthy solution. And since oysters are filter feeders, which benefit from good water flow, the approach was to lift the substrates off the sediment at the bottom of the marsh, uh, since the sediment can smother oyster spat and prevent them from attaching and growing. Uh, and these work, work much better than the uh, concrete oyster balls that they were also testing. Um, and they were much easier to move. And, uh, and we were excited that after about six to nine months, there were uh, one plate in particular had over 180 oysters on one panel. So uh, kind of these results uh, kind of gave us the green light to proceed with the next project, next part of the project. Um, so when the design of the culvert got changed from uh, precast to poured in place concrete, there was an opportunity to texture the wall directly. And so we met the contractors and it was this kind of back and forth negotiation to create a texture using horizontal board forms of various depths. And th this was all done during the lockdown when you know, all but the most essential projects were on hold. Uh, but we came to a consensus which would add a minimal amount of concrete to the, text to the wall uh, while not compromising the overstructural structural requirements for steel, concrete coverage, et cetera. So we exchanged drawings and they produced a few mock-ups before the construction. Uh, and here you can see the, uh, the poured, poured in place concrete, uh, the textured wall and the completed culvert. Uh, and we designed a system whereby we could, um, whereby panels could sit on a one inch square ledger uh, and this was pre-drilled and mounted on anchor bolts protruding from the ridges on the wall, you can see on the, on the left. Uh, these ledgers in turn could hold the contoured panels, which could be adjusted and mounted at different heights and orientations. And additionally, they created a horizontal datum within which to study the growth at varying heights of the wall. Um, for the panels, uh, in designing the panels, we focus primarily on their sections. 
since they mounted to the wall with that one inch separation that allowed uh, the design to consider settlement on both the inside and outside of the panel. And we worked with uh, TCA Master of Architecture alum, Sean Cunningham, who's here, um, who continued uh, after graduation as a research fellow for AL and helped us to, to adapt some of the general generative modeling scripts from the float lab uh, project to this new uh, panel. Uh, so we limited the panels to a seven inch height and we pushed the complex surface to uh, kind of maximize disturbance and, and water flow um, to kind of build upon the lessons from the optimized substrates. Uh, additionally, these panels had holes of various sizes, which were modeled as voids. Uh, in the surface, allowing to create even more uh, flow behind the panels. So on the left, you can see uh, kind of a larger view of the two types of panels, one with uh, two holes and one with a much greater variety of holes. And these are designed to connect to uh, the pre-drilled hole, pre holes on the ledgers and sit either horizontally or vertically. And on the right are some of the views of the established oysters, which have bonded to the bumpy surface. And based upon uh, these tests, we've uh, kind of developed a working theory that uh, inverse or concave curvature, when oysters settle there, they seem to grow better. And the actual breaching of the connection of the creek with the marsh took place in the winter of uh, 2020. And you can see the uh, contractors and ecologists both watching this kind of expansion of the, of the marsh. And this is kind of this dramatic moment when the fresh and salt water kind of emerged for the first time. Uh, so on the left, you can see uh, our original rendering. Uh, and on the right, uh, a recent photo of the completed culvert. Uh, based on the information from civil engineers, everyone expected a lower water level as shown in the rendering. Uh, but the reality has been that the water was much higher almost completely to the top of the culvert. Um, the good news is that oysters get more solid habitat. They're happy. Uh, but for us, it means we have to, we can't wait until the culvert has So instead, we're kind of dependent on scuba gears to get in there for all the So given this, it became apparent that we needed to communicate the intent of the project with an animation since the public will have limited opportunity to experience it. So merging the Revit model from the contractors with the Rhino model from, uh, from our lab of the panels, we worked with, uh, with Maria Rosalind, uh, architecture here, to create a fish and I swim through experience. So you can see the spaces between the panels and the wall and how the perforations create complex spaces which allow for settlement and uh, spaces for oysters. Hello, Marina, this, this uh, video has been incredibly informative to the ecologists. So the water would never be this clear, but it's a way for us to be able to see what it would be like to be a fish. And uh, truly, we find that ecologists have found gobies and different fish that are hiding out behind these plates. So yeah, we had we put in, we uh, we had fabricated 32 panels uh, with these four different types, and uh, here they are being brought to the inner marsh. And here you can see our uh, ecologist John Oliver uh, in his scuba gear um, sampling the panels. And there are really three ways to sample them uh, and count the animals that have settled on the place. Uh, the first is to completely remove them, which we did at the beginning in order to count. And the second is to uh, sort of temporarily remove them, as you see here, and put them in a saltwater tub and then uh, put them back. And the third is to photograph them in place, uh, photograph the walls and the panels in place. And uh, that allows for more qual quantitative measurement of settlements. And we designed this kind of GoPro handheld frame to, to be able to go down there and, and uh, and spot the oysters. Um, 
And so here are some of the uh, images of the sampling process, which allows collection of data, which uh, will go into a future publication. Uh, and these, these images were taken just after the panels were installed. You can see the first settlement, which is these tunicates, these uh, long tunicates that were on the bottom of the flow lab. But aside from oysters, there were also crabs, which you can see in that middle frame, um, uh, which used the ridges and fish like goby that would settle behind the panels or on the ledges. And on the right, you can see a visit by a group of high school graduates from uh, the nearby field station that just opened at Tunnel Tops Park. Uh, and they're able to uh, pull those panels out and have them count the oysters and um, this part of their summer internship. And here's uh, some video footage of the oyster panels underwater. These ones are exposed to the light, so they're on, kind of on the wing walls. And they have, uh, so they have uh, both animals and algae growing on them, as opposed to the ones in the culvert, which don't have any algae. And if you look close, you can see those white specks. Those are oysters. Um, and uh, they're pretty funny because they, they're quite large. And you, those weren't evident um, in Christmas before. Yeah, they really, we found out that they really didn't have a place to hold on to attach to. Um, so, in conclusion, like projecting forward from this uh, project is uh, how can this work contribute to future infrastructural projects? And how are the lessons learned from this project can impact the integration of animal habitats applicable to larger projects like the new seawall in San Francisco, uh, the planning for which is well underway? Uh, thinking about the potentials, what the potentials are for this site, in a way, it brings us back to the first Boyne Ecology Studio series, which was cited on the Embarcadero and involved the first speculations about floating architecture and marine habitat next to uh, Autodesk Pier 9. Uh, currently, I'm working with the Port of San Francisco. Uh, they have an engineering with nature working group. And to speculate how to integrate ecological habitats within the new infrastructure plans uh, to address sea level rise and threats of flooding and ecological stewardship. Uh, so we hope to embed some of these ideas of the culvert reef into the strategic planning of the project and scale up the research. So the next set of projects developed within a framework of the Biodesign Challenge. It's an international annual design competition based in New York City that brings together teams from all disciplines to speculate on the intersection of biology and design. Since 2019, we've worked with student teams from CCA to develop proposals for the challenge. It's given us the opportunity to zoom into what, what may not be visible, in, that may be invisible, to our eye, like the plankton image here. The beautiful reveals microplastics in yellow that these small animals are eating and then being eaten by larger animals like fish that then we eat. We formed the Sea Shift Collaborative as a platform to showcase the CCA architecture team's work for the challenge. Partners in this work include cellular biologists from UC San Francisco, scientists from the Kosh Lab at Stanford University and designers from UC Davis. One of the, collaborative, the collaborative's first project is called the Living Data Pod from 2020. It's an example of how speculative design by students can propel research into, prototype, into the prototype phase. This project started with the concern of microplastics in our bay, 40% of which come after rains like we had Tuesday which wash synthetic rubber tire dust accumulated on the highways into the bay. This team's interest was how to design an architecture that will not contribute to our microplastic problem, but would degrade back into the environment using materials like PHA, a biodegradable plastic, and wood. The project imagines a new form of public engagement and education using projections to visualize microplastic content in the bay's water with a small floating sensor inspired by the plankton scope device de developed by the Prakash lab at Stanford University. After the competition, we were able to secure funding for a NOAA grant to prototype the plankton scope itself. 
The Plankton Scope is an open imaging platform for citizen oceanography that provides a real-time identification and count of plankton in the water. We are also working with the Prakash Lab to adapt the Plankton Scope lighting to identify microplastics. Our partners in this phase was the Treasure Island Sailing Center, which has a STEM education program that brings public school children to learn about science and ecology on the waterfront while also learning how to sail. We built a plankton scope with the help of research fellow from Adam from uh, Prakash Lab to teach both fifth graders and college students at UC Davis about this imaging platform. CCA alumni, Maria, uh, Valeria, and Lena have played an important role in the engagement aspect of this work that we did um, a summer ago. We're cur currently working with alum ETN Ma that was uh, on the original team for the Biodesign Challenge and the Prakash Lab and Autodesk Technology Center to prototype a new version of the plankton scope that is autonomous and self-sampling rather than the current version, which is handheld and fed manually with water. We are building the small scale model at Autodesk Technology Center using the CNC shopbot to carve an inexpensive yet strong carboys that help to, help to float the wood platform that will hold the autonomous self-sampling plankton scope. The device will be moored in Clipper Cove on Treasure Island to test the system. And once successful, we will deploy them in different sites like the Presidio near the float lab to monitor the difference in real-time data within the bay. And this is a video testing the buoyancy of the wood and carboys during a strong wind and rainstorm back in October. And we were very happy because it holds it very well. The Treasure Island, um, this site in Clipper Cove has been a great new um, location for us to test experiments that we're doing in with students and uh, at Autodesk. The, um, Drawings and, and models of the project have traveled as part of an exhibition called Tools for a Warming Planet, co-curated by Beth Ferguson from UC Davis and our CCA colleague, Sarah Dean. And it's been exhibited in Spain, Austria, and the Netherlands uh, this summer. And just as a teaser for our next project in this collaboration, we are currently working with co our colleague, Igar Kalantar, and graduate students at UCSF and current CCA students, Clara, Conrad, and Kimia, to prototype biocement for architecture facade components. And they'll be presenting their work in February of next year. So back to me, the boys on the screen. Um, the last project we'll show tonight, we thought we'd end with a project that kind of, um, in many ways represents um, our ambition as a lab and, and the kind of ideal blend of design, ecological research, and public engagement uh, that we seek out. Um, public sediment for Alameda Creek was developed in 2017, 2018, as part of the Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge, which was a competitively selected year-long research and design initiative that brought together 10 interdisciplinary teams from around the world to critically speculate about resilience at 10 different sites around the Bay Area. I should also say CCA actually had two teams uh, representation from, uh, from CCA was on two teams in this challenge, including um, a team with the Urban Works Agency, colleagues Jeanette Kim and Miraj Bhatia. Um, our team was led by Scape Landscape Architecture, um, which you may know is a leading voice in innovative approaches um, to climate adaptation. And it also included partners from the Dredge Research Collaborative, engineers from Arcadis, designers from UC Davis, landscape architects TS Studio, and public artist Cy Keener. CCA MARC alumni Jereen Pierre and Carlos Sabagal served as research assistants on the project, helping us with drawings and, pr and production throughout the year. Um, actually, can you go back one? I think we're off, but yeah. Um, the site for this project is Alameda Creek, which is the Bay's largest local tributary, runs through the East Bay cities of Fremont, Union City, and Newark. The project um, that our team developed consists of a larger vision plan for the entire 12 mile stretch of Lower Alameda Creek, which you see here, uh, runs uh, from the mountains to the bay, which was channelized and levied by the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1950s and 1960s. The larger ambitions of the project involve 
recalibrating water and sediment flows through the creek to enhance its role as a habitat for both humans and non-human species, such as the migrating steelhead that travel up and down the creek seasonally, or that, that try to travel up and down the creek. In this regard, we conceptualize the project as really having three clients or constituents, sediment, people, and fish. Central to the project is the belief that the impacts of sea level rise and climate change are not limited to the shoreline. And that resilience really also requires us to address ecological and infrastructural issues further inland. Here you can see an aerial view of the landscape of Fremont and get a sense of the levee channel that presently is optimized neither for sediment, people, nor fish. Public engagement was a crucial component of this year long project. Um, and kind of as a side note, one of the the interesting things we discovered in the outreach events led by our team was the powerful emotional connection between local residents and the native steelhead trout. In some cases, people felt uh, more passionately about the plight of the steelhead than they felt about the urgency of their own community's vulnerabilities to climate change, which was, for me, a, a kind of fascinating insight into the power of, of interspecies empathy. Our role in the project, excuse me, involved developing an alternative to the typical levees that line the creek, and that for the most part are an ecological barren zone, inhospitable to people, plants, and animals. We proposed to replace the conventional riprap of stacked rocks with a system we call the living levee, modular concrete units that maintain structural capacity while also allowing for geometric variation and different modes of inhabitation by different species, including people who are currently not permitted to enter the creek. The modules <clears throat> are inspired by the geometry of sand dollars. Um, I think if you go back one, nesting into one another as they burrow into the soil. You can see here some of the potential variations with different size apertures, allowing for different scales of vegetation to occupy the levee slope. And here are some early prototypes and simulations, understanding how they might perform in different conditions. The system is flexible enough to adapt to a variety of slopes and can accommodate step modules that allow for people to navigate and inhabit the landscape. In developing this proposal, this proposal, it was critical to preserve the system's structural capacity to reinforce the levee and prevent erosion, thereby maintaining the channel's flood control capacity, but also trying to identify opportunities for ecological improvement. So the, the whole project was really kind of negotiation between these, these two um, pressures. We think of it as one possible way to satisfy this mandate for flood control for the armored edge, while also encouraging other more productive ecological agencies for this kind of infrastructure. Here you can see the proposed cross section through the creek where the living levee lines the edges and helps contribute to a more vibrant and diverse ecosystem. The project is an example, we, we would argue, of how informed speculation can eventually lead to funding and implementation. In 2019, the state of California funded the project with $31.4 million towards implementation of the active channel concept. And we were thrilled to learn just last week that the county has secured permits to begin construction on phase one of the redesigned channel. Drawings like these explore how the proposal engages with multiple constituent species. Of course, the humans who live in this community but also the fish who are able to migrate along the creek and the pollinators who we hope would return to the restored habitat. And this work continues in the recent and current Materialities of Care studios where students are looking at the Alameda Creek watershed as a site for how we might rethink suburbia as a more biodiverse landscape of multi-species cohabitation. Here are some drawings and models from last fall's studio. And Maybe to conclude, um, we'd like to leave you with this slide. Here you see some of the multiple species clients and co-designers with whom we partner to better understand ecosystems. We believe that climate change is the defining issue of our time. And as architects, we recognize both the limits and capacities of our profession. That we can't take on these questions by ourselves, siloed safely within the confines of our own discipline but also that our training and expertise can enable us to collaborate and partner with others, with scientists, communities, and other species even to speculate and construct a better world. So thank you very much. And 
Sorry, I couldn't be there, but we welcome any comments and questions you guys have. Thank you all well, so much. You. That's incredibly inspiring. I'm gonna pull the lights up, which maybe will make Adam slightly less visible, but will be better for um, for questions. We'd be happy to, if you have any questions or curiosities about some of the projects. Bill, what do you think? <laughs> you know, any, any business that doesn't take advantage of the opportunity to work with a school like this, and with people like CCA, is it it's just they're just out of their mind? I mean, this is just fantastic. I spent my life building things to sort of add to the cultural surrounding of the community with sculpture and architecture. But this is the first time I've ever been involved in something as speculatively scientific. And it's, it's thrilling. So, and working with someone like Bill, it's only possible to work with someone that, so Bill not only did the SF MoMA facade, the new uh, museum at SF MoMA, but right now he's working on one of the biggest FRP projects down in USC for the Lucas- George Lucas Museum. Museum at, on the UC, USC campus and huge panels. I don't remember, I don't remember how many. I try not to remember. <laughs> <laughs> but it, every time we do these projects, we come, especially like the float lab, we come to Bill as well as Speculative Studios. And, he, and Marina, you got to work with Bill and Sean where you got to, you know, you would speculate and bring your digital designs. And when it came to fabrication, there was all, there, it's very hard to find part, not hard. There are, that's what I love about the Bay Area, that there are people like you that are in the industry, but are willing to, you find there's value for you to give us time to teach them why it's important to talk to you early so that you can impart on them maybe some more straightforward ways without compromising the design to yeah, realize great, the project. Yeah, great opportunity to, to, I think, to expose the students to the idea of collaboration and the benefits of collaboration, which is, seems to be what construction is gradually yeah. turning into. Thanks. I think what's so, uh, this is work that was really inspiring to me when I arrived here. Uh, I was peeking in from the outside for, for years, so a lot of our faculty. Um, and the work of the labs. What's really exciting to see in all the work that you showed tonight and the other projects that I know of is, I think this is a very rare instance of collaboration across, uh, you know, from the studio with the students through the faculty, really the faculty is kind of co-learners and guides uh, in many ways, bringing in um, scientists, right, um, who are experts in, their areas, their disciplines, bringing in manufacturers and, and, and companies who are experts in making things happen um, to, you know, actually do proof of concept work like we're seeing on the screen. Um, and, the, and the power, I think, for me, one of those powerful things is just the GIF at the beginning or the GIF, whatever we call it, right, of watching these different Animals birds, right, right. Um, sort of inhabit this thing um, that was a result of, of a range of types of collaboration. And I think it's one of the things that makes um, this particular school really unique. It what, does. What I you mean, all are doing. We aren't. We don't have a big university where we can tap in on different departments like engineering or geology. And even if you do have those, they're very hard to tap into. <laughs> even naturalists, yeah, too. You know. So what we have here in the Bay Area is this ability, and Jason's been doing it, Mark's been doing it. I just think the faculty here realizes the special position we are and we are in. in in San Francisco that we can reach out to folks at Stanford, we can reach out to folks at Davis and it's this, uh, and UCSF as uh, Conrad, Claire and Camille are learning, we, they literally can go next door and hand off in uh, materials and things like that. So it's feeling more like MIT where, you know, we're part of this kind of uh, your campus yeah, right? and, the area and campus. I think uh, the faculty here has learned how to tap in on those resources that are right here in front of us. It's been very exciting. And we're nimble enough here to be able to do it. And so I encourage 
I was telling students from our current studio with Mark that, you know, things happen because they just naturally percolate from a studio. They just, we, they weren't forced. They were like, oh, well, Bill was the first one. Like, let's test a, a two by two area of one of these speculative studios and we built it. And then one thing leads to another. And so that's really how the work happens within the lab. It, sometimes it's the biodesign challenge that allows us, gives us the platform. But oftentimes it's driven by things that students have uncovered. And so I encourage you to, if you have an idea, come up to us and talk to us about it. And so many people like Conrad came up to me early, like when he first got here, when we were training in the shop and he was telling me how he was interested in the architecture and ecologies lab and Claire too, she was interested. So those things sort of stick. There wasn't anything particular, but then it materialized. We're like, Conrad, Claire. So it's not always, it's not uh, as always as planned um, as you might think. Questions or reflections from collaborators in the room? It's, it's really great to be back here. That's great. I think it was really, what's been a really great learning experience in working with folks um, uh, over the UCSF is how we can be, we sometimes get to this place where we're stuck in our silos using our sort of um, familiar tools, uh, familiar modes of gathering data and analyzing data, but um, teaching each other about what we do um, has sort of revealed um, ways of communicating uh, design intent or scientific uh, data gathering intent across, um, you know, across fields. And for ways that what they're doing in their labs can inform our designs and vice versa, what we're looking at with our prototyping and our sort of design thinking informing what they're, uh, what they're studying. It's been, it's been really cool. I think the energy we give each other is really infectious. Still the floating classroom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. A really great <clears throat> observation from all of these is like the structural performance and how it's not just of the object, but it's of animals and you know flora and et cetera. So when you put a slab onto the ground, we're realizing like the whole ground is this network of fungi. <laughs> yeah, and how can that activate that kind of living, living organism yes. instead of just being a yeah. dumb slab, right. et cetera, et cetera. So is the beauty of in the water or on a cliffside and like how they become formative, not just structurally, but holding water and plants, et cetera. So it's beautiful to see that kind of thing. That is so structure. interesting. I hadn't thought about it as a slab. And, lit like and literally when we, uh, when it was Autodesk that sponsored a studio, mm -hmm. they wanted to have a floating um, workshop. But we learned quite quickly that floating means filling according to the agencies. So even though you aren't filling, you're creating shadow on what's below. And so it's considered fill. So it was by reaching out to an ecologist that was willing to take us on because it's hard to find people that are you know, willing to go outside their own discipline too. And you realize, oh, if we don't have to move fast, which boats do. So fouling is kind of for a boat person because fouling creates resistance and resistance is not what you want when you want to go fast. But in something that doesn't have to move, that resistance can actually be a benefit. So on that, has there been an exploration of like pollen and like in the air, like holding that and then activating growth through pollen in the air? Has there been no. that? That sounds fascinating. Maybe Adam, are your students thinking about that? 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 Yeah, uh, your student. Adam and Claire, you guys can think about that. Or Adam, have you guys thought absolutely. about that? No, but I love it. I know, I don't know if James Graham is here tonight, but he's teaching a class on air in the spring, which sounds amazing. We should give that to him. We'll, we'll tell him about that. But it is interesting to operate in this, in this environment where you're you're trying to encourage ecologies in areas where ecologists don't even dare to tread, you know? So there's also this kind of sense of like, oh, you know, you can't, you can't grow things on that. Or, you know, there's, there's some people who are saying, you know, floating is not 
that's not the way to create ecology. You know, it's it has to be like, you know, we have to restore the wetlands. You know, but you're not going to restore the wetlands in San Francisco. You're not going to, you know, there are environments which are, you know, getting built up, getting replaced. There's in hard infrastructure. So kind of gray green has just become kind of a term that people are now talking about. But um, when we started this work, that wasn't even really a, a discussion topic. Um, so I've been doing work up in the Delta recently, and the Delta, as we know, far enough up, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's uh, sweet water. It's not, yeah. not salty. And something I learned about uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago was that I think it might be UC Davis, but I'm not sure you can kind of, they're working with uh, Army Corps of Engineers to create these uh, fish hatcheries that are uh, embedded in the riprap Ooh. along the river, right? Nice. Uh, they're, trying to be, they're trying to bring back steelhead, okay. right? And uh, I, you know, I was just curious if you knew much about that. No, I do you know, Adam, did you, do you know about that? No, I haven't heard that, but it's- yeah. really You might want to look into that. But the other thing is that, you know, on your levy, uh, your modular levy blocks, uh -huh. I, you know, I, I've been this morning. I drove back and, and watched them. They're they're putting in riprap um, Isleton and uh, Vieira Island, which is you know basically kind of a vacation little island, where they're building some type of a it, it might be a bikeway or a causeway or something you know right up against the the levee by creating this kind of wide. Uh, you know, a, a path of some sort. It looks like they're going to on top of the levee. Well, no, it's actually <laughs> this is so interesting. It's if you have a cross section of the levee and you have the river, it's actually on the riverside, and it's you know it's within the flood zone. It seems because the river fluctuates maybe five or six feet easily, and uh, so uh, the the thing I was. Uh, taking note of when I saw your project was the, the kind of brute force. If you've ever watched them put the riprap in with their barges, it's kind of amazing. I mean, it is unbelievably uh, industrial, right? But I, I, I just think about the, the precision with which the levee blocks that you have developed have to be built up. How they would be how they would be picked up, how they would be, you know, Place because they're being placed by barges that are on the water that are moving and the precision that's you know required there. They basically just take massive boulders and and yeah. drop them <laughs> and then hit them with the shovel. Oh, really? You know, with yeah. the with the with the scoop yeah. itself and everything shades. It's quite impressive. Adam, you want to add, answer <laughs> that one? I mean, Eco Concrete has thought about this. They are a company that really is sort of on the leading edge of ecology and infrastructure of this scale. They have created these mats. So you take these components. They're interlocked. They're interlocked. They just lay them down. Just lay them down like a heavy blanket. On are they this. soft? No, they're concrete. They're concrete. But it allows you to not, like what we've showed, lay it down one by one like bricks. Yeah, they're linked. Right. They're modular. They're modular. Right. So Tiles. certainly if we got to a point, we got to prototype at that scale, yeah. we would be thinking in terms of that too. Yeah. But one of the things we did uh, when we were working with folks that are responsible for the channel, they don't like vegetation because vegetation can create you know, problems during big storms. So they really like the idea that uh, you could have vegetation, but they're controlled within these modules. So we made holes so that we could use the root system to stabilize right. those modules, but they would be limited. So they wouldn't just expand. And so that, that was kind of this happy medium that they're like, okay, thumbs up to growing things. Uh, and we like the control. And it worked for us in terms of stabilization. Uh, um, well, first of all, I wanna say you guys are superheroes um, with incredible energy and it's what you guys have brought to the conversation of the school is incredibly valuable and um and adam and we were just at acadia and alex and the guard and everyone that's sort of like overlapping in this genre i mean it's incredible to see um and i was kind of struck by what bill just said about about um 
about you've been so focused on culture and, and art practices and architecture. What I loved about your about what's happening now, which is maybe different than maybe six years ago, is that this has become a cultural, it's an ecological project, but it's become a cultural project for you guys too. Yeah. You're not locked into um, uh, these kind of tropes of like recreating nature or replacement and these kinds of things. I think what's really extraordinary about what's beginning to kind of percolate and for sure with the students also overlaying ideas of aesthetics and beauty um, craft and and also just um, kind of human habitation and this kind of cross species notion I think is a really powerful way to begin to kind of create a conversation about, about human occupation being a part of this um, ecological mix and I think that's the the real value and it's it's like you guys are sort of you, know, you think of like the whole earth catalog yeah. as this moment of you know being you know going to the moon and you want to see the earth from afar but it feels like what you're doing now is it's like a very similar notion but it's like from within mm -hmm. you know it's a sort of like it's like an inversion you're like seeing the planet from from within the planet in a totally different way um, you know, and so I'm just like trying to think of a way to construct, like even the, all these slides, like constructing this and making an argument for this as being as important as the whole Earth catalog was, what, how many years ago? Um, you know, we also love that. I don't anybody we, remembers that. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> but I want to coming just back, actually, actually, that idea is coming back. And the idea that we can do something that is at a scale that we can prototype and we can test and is actionable and we can not just talk about it but try and see what because a lot of these things don't work they fail but we one of the things that we've learned from working with scientists that failure is part of how things develop and i think we try to say that in the studio we try to say get things out that are ugly but you know or things that might not work but i think other disciplines understand that that that's how progress happens and so that's been really excellent. And then, then how it, I think what the scientists have also taught us is that they're used to working at such a small, it gets smaller and smaller to get into a PhD and their research. And they love working with us because we work, we also talk about things at a scale of impact that is much larger. Even though we're working small, we can pull out and show the impact at a you know much larger scale, which is you know something. There's a, uh, I'd love, you know, the title of Adam's studio, Materialities of Care, I think also just wraps up for me everything that you all are doing, like care as a kind of sensibility and attending to, really you're tending to things that architecture has been for the most part indifferent to except as obstacles or barriers in many cases, right? It, it struck me when you talked about the slab, right? Like, just, um, and so attend, you know, attending to, um, underserved peoples, uh, you know, uh, non-human species, right? Basically everything else alive, you know, architecture has been essentially indifferent to throughout history, except humans. And it, well, in a limited set of humans at that. Um, and so I think that, you know, that perspective combined with the designer sensibility and the attention to, you know, a range of parameters must be really exciting for scientists, right? Because it does, provide them a kind of different lens on the world, right? Coming out of that narrow space. So in February, Conrad and team and Claire and Camille will be presenting. So I hope you look out for their presentation because they will be here with UCSF. And I think you can hear firsthand why this is valuable for them. Because uh, it's one thing for us to say it, but it's another to hear from them firsthand why it is so. Well, and I love this notion you described it as the MIT kind of this complex. So, like, if we could figure out a way to say that without saying MIT, <laughs> <laughs> that would be really great. But essentially, like a consortium, right? And we have those partnerships and partnerships with the industry. It's so nice to have you here, Bill. Um, but Autodesk now over at Pier Nine, the partners at, at UCSF, Stanford, <laughs> um, Benthic Lab, you know, Jason and Nagar, like Autodesk, those connections. Jeanette with connections, you know, with, with, you know, industry, our labs are really bringing, bringing different people into this, uh, 
I was going to say ecosystem, but really building an ecosystem within which we can thrive and the students can thrive and really think about what architecture needs to be, not what architecture has been. One of the things that was, I think, new for us for this lecture and thinking about all the work was uh, that diagram. You know, we had the three, you know, strands woven together. I think it was really helpful to just think of like almost each project could have like little highlights of where these different people come together because it's really just the project comes in one way and it's touched by all these uh, other people, the public, ecologists, and you just get this uh, amazing sort of code almost of how, how uh, each, each one is in the project. So I'm so happy. Thank you, alum and students at Dave, because I know it's hard, but it's so great to see you. You, you really, you can see how your work, Chris, Sean Marina has, you know, you're going to go into graduate school, but I we're really excited that somehow I think a little bit of architecture ecologies will get embedded in your next stage <laughs> of the work. So, and those of you that are still here and want to be involved, please uh, come and talk to us or take one of the studios that uh, that Adam or you know that you see that has some association with the lab or the digital craft lab as well. We're is uh, it's very exciting for us to work with you. You, your energy gener and your questions always. You're you're the you know you really are the drivers that have uh, created this. We would have never, uh, Adam. I would think you would agree. I mean, when we first started, we were like, "Why is everything cool in New York City and there's nothing like a blue up here?" And so now we're very happy that we can show examples of things that really are precedents that are happening here in the Bay. The Bay is very protected from an ecological point of view. That's one of the reasons why it's very hard to do projects like that, like this. So that's why creating a precedent with the float lab, thanks to Bill, thanks to generous funders, uh, is just the beginning of cracking open a conversation that's possible. And thanks to CCA, so thank you. Thank you all yeah. so much.